Shirley, and welcome, <laughs> welcome to us. Thank you. Listening to Simon and James, I thought to myself, this is the new generation, bright, bright, brilliant young, would be, in one case, an MP, in the other case, a would be MP. Um, and how nice to hear them. But there was one tiny trickle in the back of my mind because some of you who remember French, I'm going to say one line in French to you and see if you can translate it. Plus ça change. Oh. Plus c'est la même chose. Yeah. <laughs> what it means is, however it much it changes, it always turns out to be the same in English. Um, listening to Simon talking about the Cambridge-Oxford link, I couldn't help forgetting the day that I went as a university student up to Oxford, only to discover that the Oxford-Cambridge railway line had just been closed. <laughs> and if you go there now, you will find that along <coughs> the track that used to go from Oxford to Cambridge, there's a disused railway line, which is about, as rightly was said by Simon, to be brought back into operation again. It just goes to show how often we chase up a one-way street and then come back the other way. <laughs> of course, it's right that it should be reopened, and it would make a great deal of difference to the West Midlands, I think, to that part of the country. But the tragedy is that we let Beeching close it, along with thousands of other, well, not thousands, but a great many other branch, branch lines, when we were all in love with the motor car, and now we've discovered what a mistake that was, not least in freight for trucks. And we've gone back to the idea, quite rightly, that there should be much more dependence on rail. And Simon has said, quite rightly too, the commitment that the Lib Dems are making to it. You've, I've seen some of you this afternoon already. You've had to bear a short speech from me, and so I apologise for being back again. And I hope those of you in the front row won't mind too much. But what, they, what I'm going to say, I shall say briefly, and then if you've got questions, you're very welcome. I'll attempt to answer them. But let me be very quick. The first thing is, to those of you who didn't hear me this afternoon, uh, that I want to say just a word about the coalition itself. Um, I remember about earlier this week, I was having dinner. I don't often have time to have dinner, but I had dinner this time. It was Easter Sunday. Um, and some friends of mine invited two other friends I didn't know one of whom was a very senior member of the <coughs> financial services uh, setup. He had been responsible for dealing with the after effects of Maxwell's cheating of the Mirror employees through pinching their pension. He'd actually been hauled in by the Mirror to try and sort it out. And then very sensibly, the government thought, well, this is a man who knows about how you deal with botched pension schemes, <coughs> so maybe he'll be good at dealing with botched banks. And I remember him saying it was very electrifying. He said, I remember in my role as the financial, uh, co the, the financial conduct authority, it was actually, being rung up at three o'clock one morning in 2009 and told that the Royal Bank of Scotland was going to announce that it was bankrupt at the first opening of the morning broadcasts, 9 o'clock. In other words, this was 3 a.m., and at 8 a.m. it was going to work on a public announcement which was going out saying we are unable to meet any depositors' claims. Ordinary depositors who had a few thousand quid or perhaps 20,000 quid or even 100,000 quid in Royal Bank of Scotland, which don't forget was the second biggest bank in the country after HSBC and Barclays was roughly the same size. Most of us hadn't got a clue as we slept on our beds that Monday morning that we were that close to the collapse of the British banking system, and we were. It wasn't to the point, I think, to go on blaming the Labour government. They didn't, went awfully sensible. But certainly this was not a national crisis. This was a global crisis, an international crisis of the first scale because some of you will remember that while we were looking at the Royal Bank of Scotland and, of course, at Northern Rock, which was the very first one, you remember the pictures of Northern Rock, mm -hmm. the queues forming outside that building society, people desperately waiting to see if they could get their cash out, not rich people, people for whom this was usually all their savings. And we also know that if that had happened, if we'd seen Royal Bank of Scotland go down, as Northern Rock did go down, we would have certainly seen before long Lloyds, 
which is even today two-thirds owned by the taxpayer, and then possibly following it, the strongest of them, which was Barclays. And of course, HBOS also hit, as you know, the buffers, and did actually have to be saved by the government. So that whole rank of British banking, and British banks were very important, very significant, very weighty. You had at least three banks, big banks, which passed into the possession of the government. And they passed into possession <coughs> of the government because the Prime Minister agreed to allow taxpayers' money in their billions to be used to save the banks. And it was frankly a huge gamble. If it had gone wrong, the market hadn't been persuaded that these banks could be saved, we would today be in a tremendously deep depression, an almost Greek style of depression. I said that because I think almost nobody realises, among many of the voters we're going to be talking to and have been talking to, how close this country came to collapse and how much it mattered to create a coalition. What I find is one of the hardest things that I do when I'm campaigning is explaining to voters who are, well, on the whole, well consistent towards the Liberal Democrats, quite liked them, quite wanted to keep them, voted for them in 2005, that we had to take steps that saved this country from collapse. It's as strong as that. Saved it from collapse. And if you don't believe what I'm saying, then look at other countries, like Holland, like Germany, like France, and above all, the United States, the most important economy in the world, to see how great that threat was. Now, in the scope of that threat, when we have originally decided to enter the <coughs> coalition, the main reason for that was that the coalition gave the world the indication that we were going to go down to try to work our way through the financial crisis, that we were not going to slaughter banks and companies and all the rest of right and left, that we were going to try to make the government work. And the government was there for all the five years we pledged, and we remained in government for all those five years, but we also managed to do some very good things. We stopped, I think, the Conservative Party from favouring its own supporters, who are mostly in the upper income half of society. We made the business of raising the threshold for people who were in either in medium or low paid positions so that they would get some benefit at least, the burden wouldn't be all placed on the wealthy, but would be shared across the front. And what many people don't realise that even today, <coughs> the threshold does not apply to people in the 40% bracket and above. It just isn't true, the argument we've somehow landed us all on the poor. And we made sure that the educational system was protected by the pupil premium in other ways, helping kids from disadvantaged families. So although there's not much money going around, it's only just now that we're beginning to pick up. The great achievement of the coalition was to protect, to some extent at least, the least well off, to protect very substantially pensioners, because pensioners are the one group in our society who've actually come out somewhat better off than they went in in 2010. People forget that almost completely. <coughs> it's true. We have no good, thank you. We <coughs> have protected pensioners, we have protected children from the poorest families, and those things are things that are worth remembering. I don't like people who talk to us as if we had no principles and no values, because I know that people like Nick and Danny Alexander and Stephen Webb have fought like tigers, yeah. cabinet after cabinet after cabinet, to persuade and indeed in some cases virtually threaten the Conservatives that they had to support this fairer outcome. And now the other great achievement, and it really was an achievement, and I know a lot of people, the Labour Party and so on, reasonably enough argue that you know the pay isn't high enough, it isn't. But it's also true that we have had a remarkable reaction in the field of unemployment, with at the moment less than 5% of British people unemployed, which is not much different than it was when we were quite prosperous. And the older people in the, this audience, and some of you are like me, older, will remember what it meant when in the 1980s, let alone in the 1930s, unemployment crept up towards 8%, 9%, 10%, and you had the feeling of devastated desperation in places like South Yorkshire and the Rust Belt and so forth. <coughs> and Mrs Thatcher drove a lot of companies into 
bankruptcy in the 1980s. So we should be <coughs> more appreciative, perhaps, of the good fortune that's come our way. Now, where do we go from there? Well, I think there are three big issues, <coughs> two of them domestic. First domestic issue, the National Health Service. It is a great service by any standards. I was talking in North Norfolk about the fact that last week, two of my very dear friends from long ago when we were all at university together, succeeded, they'd been married for 65 years. They fell over one another and one was taken off to hospital immediately where she died and the other one, the man, the husband, was taken off to hospital in a different place. The NHS took him, badly, badly injured, to see her dying 30 miles away in a different hospital because they felt that people who had been married for 65 years should have a chance to say goodbye. And they succeeded in saying goodbye. They had been married all that time. But can you imagine that any kind of private health system would have sent an ambulance to take a husband to see his dying wife when it was under constant pressure all the time in the way that it has been? And would anybody else imagine that you would have that kind of sympathy and sense that they showed? The NHS, as far as I'm concerned, it's got its faults, of course it has. But it's a wonderful system and it's one that we've got to preserve. And preserving it is going to require from us a degree of realism that we haven't yet shown, or more precisely, that our two competing parties have not shown. We've said where we're going to get £8 billion from. It will include things like increasing the tax on the capital gains tax, sorry, the increase in the tax rate on capital gains. It will include <coughs> extending the rates so that they go for people who are living in houses with more than, worth more than £300,000, a higher level of rates than you all pay and I all pay as ordinary rate payers. And you probably know that right now the rates end well before £300,000 and there's nothing higher up there to bring into the tax thing. And of course, thirdly, Danny Alexander's majestic, I mean, gigantic efforts to pursue all the people that try to evade or avoid tax from the person who does a building job and says, pay me in cash. And nobody needs to smile at me because all of us are realistic and know what that's all about. Two of the people who are really rich and are taking large sums of money and plonking it into the Jersey or Guernsey or one of the Channel Islands to escape tax altogether. He thinks he'll get a lot of money out of that. But it's not a field where the dear Tories have shown a great deal of enthusiasm for pursuing <laughs> these particular people. So that's the position that we have to try to deal with finding money for the health service. It's going to be quite a lot of money and it's going to be altogether worth it for an ageing population and one where many people with multiple kinds of illness survive because we do put the money into making sure that they can. And you all know that people who would once ago have, lots ago have died <coughs> from pneumonia or from tuberculosis or from various kinds of uh, other illness are still alive and still with us and we're grateful for that. But, of course, it does make the health service more expensive. Issue number two, we're going to have to do everything we can to improve our skill level, and that's why the Lib Dems have very much pushed the something like two million apprenticeships that have been created in the last five years to try and give us a skill-based economy and not a skill-weak economy. Here in Norfolk, I'm right, I think, in saying that something like 16,000 apprenticeships have been created just in the last year. And that's beginning to move the county up into being a more skill-based, and that means better paid county, than it's traditionally been, because traditionally it's been, as you know very well, a lowly paid county with a few wealthy people sitting dotted among it. But what we need to do is build the whole level up so that your sons and daughters have skill work, well paid, instead of ineffective payment for bad jobs, and I'm afraid that the level of quality of education in Norfolk, and Simon has been working on this more than most, hasn't, hasn't enabled us to get the sorts of jobs that they would have got, for example, in Cambridgeshire, let alone London. So we've got to pull up the skill levels, and we're beginning to do that, and we've been more interested and involved in that than any other government since the war. Finally, and last of all, I don't need to go on and I won't go on, anyway, the former Prime, Labour Prime Minister went on. But just to say that I think from the point of view of the future, 
it would be a piece of madness for this country to suddenly walk out of Europe, the biggest single market that we have. It would be a piece of madness for us to decide that we wanted no more to do with what's going on in the world, like Mr. Farage. We have to make our contribution because the world is quite a dangerous place. And I think Britain has always made such a contribution. It did recently over the Ebola crisis in a very dramatic and excellent way. And so I think that we need to maintain a strong Liberal Democrat commitment that's always been there towards internationalism and towards our responsibilities in the world. Thank you for listening. Sorry to go on, but um, I tried to cover some big things very quickly. And thank you for taking the time and trouble to come. And thank you not least for the support that you give to Simon and James, because that's something that we need to do as a team. And all of us are very grateful to them for standing for Parliament. And in the case of Simon, James won't mind me adding, for being a first-class constituency MP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So I have a couple of questions. Yes, that would be lovely. Um, Chairman. <coughs> I would suggest that Shirley yeah. sits down and answers yes. the questions. Yes, yes. Would you like to you sit down? Long day? <laughs> yes. well, it's you've had a long day. You. You've been lovely and you so pleasure, a great pleasure for you to come here. First question, please, to Shirley, or anybody. Yes, <coughs> Felicity. Listening to the news to, uh, this evening. Which I haven't done, of course. Yeah, which you <laughs> haven't done. You came over very well. Oh, thank you. But again, they were talking about immigration as one of the major issues. What can the Liberal Democrats do to try and make the debate based more on accuracy of the circumstances rather than on the scaremongering that we are getting from other parties? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the Labour Party is guilty about this, so that if you push it hard enough, it will tend to come out the right side. I think the three things really are, one, take people on when they talk a lot of UKIP rubbish. I mean, there are three obvious examples. Obvious example number one, we wouldn't have an NHS at all if it wasn't for the very substantial contribution made not just by doctors, but also, of course, not least by nurses. Go, if you happen to be a, a Christian, go to church and look, count the number of Filipinos you see. Most of those Filipinos are nurses. They're very, very good nurses, and they tend to be very family value kinds of people, good people, and very good nurses and also very good carers, they all fall into that category. Go out and see how many British people want to be carers unless they're actually related to the elderly person. And the answer is almost none. Because it's badly paid, it's demanding work, and there isn't any longer the ethic of responsibility for the elderly in quite the way that is true still, surprisingly, if you like, of some developing countries. If you want to look for that ethically strongest, <coughs> look to Asia. I'm afraid, don't look to Europe or to Britain. Second group of, of, of groups, which I can mention, I think, very strongly, is students. Again, you haven't got the UEA, but you've got Nor Norwich. Um, without overseas students, something like a third of our universities would close, because they wouldn't have enough students to actually justify the uh, employing of professors and doctors and the rest that they need. Um, we know that because when we in the Parliament have looked at something which I think is very foolish, which is the attempt by the government, the Conservative members of the government, to suggest that all students are immigrants, when we know perfectly well that 80% of students go back whence they came, they don't want to be immigrants, they want to go back to where they were, um, then you can see that this is a very substantial part today of the most successful part of the British economy, which is education higher education, highly successful, and highly successful because a third of the people that go are from other countries. They're Nigerians and Americans and Canadians and Australians and Africans and all the rest of it. And not only are we giving a real contribution to the world, we're also, bluntly, doing our economy a great deal of good, if you put it frankly. Last of all, there's the growing movement of people on holiday, to travel, school exchanges and so on, you don't catch that with the economy, just sort of single-minded looking at that. You catch that in terms of the whole enrichment of our culture. I'm old enough to remember when Britain was almost entirely white. It was a great deal more boring than it is today. It's much more exciting now. It's a much more varied and diverse country. 
And although some people that puts their backs up, they don't want to meet people who aren't like themselves. I think for most of us, including most young people, the idea of living in a diverse and exciting society with lots of wide culture and so forth is very exciting. Yeah. So try any of the three. You try the economic bit on the, on the business people, try the education bit on the education people, and try the final bit about culture on any man or woman you know who's got a broad and imaginative mind. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, there's a question, please. Um, yes, um, obviously the increase in uh, student tuition fees has proved to be highly controversial, yeah. although I think quite clearly the system that we've put in place uh, is showing benefits, I think. Uh, the rate of admissions to universities is increasing. I think there's an sort of 18% increase in admissions to the UEA. Uh, but obviously a lot of young people are disappointed with the uh, policy and maybe some of those have drifted away to support other parties. So I wondered if perhaps you could suggest ways that perhaps we could uh, try and win those voters back. Thank you. Yeah, good question. Um, I think, let me begin by saying that the, the basic problem is that people don't know <coughs> what the change was. If you know what the change was, and I've had to learn it by heart, more or less. The f most important difference was that we went up from a limit of <coughs> £15,000. Under the old system, the one before the 2010 government was elected, I guess you'd call it the Labour system, people were having to repay their student loans once they reached a wage of £15,000 a year. Now, that was the min pretty well the minimum wage at the time. So people who got jobs, but who got jobs which were just a little bit above the basic pay at the time, would start paying their taxes back, and their, their uh, funds back. And that, of course, affected most people who were getting jobs at that time. It got pushed up to 21,000, and that meant that instead of it being the basic pay, it was the common wage that people got at the age of 19 or 20, very few young men and women got jobs for more than 21,000. We're talking, don't forget, about 2010. Very few people got jobs about that level, as they went to somewhere like the city, in which case they were probably paid a hell of a lot. What that meant was that the, a very large part of the student body, nearly half, were not paying back anything at that stage for their university education. They were not paying back, I repeat, anything. And the group that benefited more than any other group <coughs> were young women. Because most young women, if they got a job, would probably move back to being half-time or part-time, or in sometimes, some cases taking time off for a couple of years when they had their children. And what that meant was, and it's still true today, if you look at the actual levels of repayment of student loans, very many young women are not repaying student loans at all until they go back to work after they've had their children their children have reached primary or secondary school level. Nobody has noticed that. Women in this room will know that very often women are simply invisible. This is a very good example of it. It hasn't been noticed by the student organisations that a great large part of the women aren't doing it. The other group that aren't doing it are young men who get low-paid jobs, for example, jobs in catering, jobs in holiday, jobs in tourism, jobs in farming, actually a rather large part of them being the kind of jobs you might have got in Norfolk a few years ago. Maybe not the jobs you get in London. And what that means is that, again, low-paid young men, along with many young women, don't repay their student loans. In some cases, they never do. 40% of people who take out loans today don't ever repay them because they never get to a point uh, where they have to start paying. What does that mean? It means against all the things you've been told. I'm not saying it's better. It's difficult. I'm not sure you should ever have taken the pledge. That's another story. But what I can say absolutely clearly is that the beneficiaries of the change in the structure have been overwhelmingly the relatively low paid and overwhelmingly not the very high paid who do fall into the position where they have to start repaying the loan. So don't leave, let anybody tell you that we have made it harder for poor students, it isn't true. And that's borne out by the fact that you probably know from, since you sound like a statistician, 
or a man who understands figures at least, look it up and you'll discover <coughs> that, the, that today, this year, 2015, but also right back to 2012, the highest proportion of young men and women from disadvantaged families ever to go to university is now in university compared to what we're told by, I'm afraid, people who have bought the publicity but not looked into the facts. Thank you very much. Are we doing that time? Will I? We're waiting for James. Waiting for James, yeah. Yes. Waiting for himself. Um, there's a lot of talk about zero hours contracts, and I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about zero hours contracts. I've got four daughters in their twenties and I'm sorry. So there's a lot of there's a lot of talk about zero hours contracts, and I think there's a lot misunderstood about zero hours contracts. I've got four daughters in their twenties and several of them have been on the receiving end of sort of dubious practices by quite large companies in Britain um, in recent years, where for example um, one of them had been asked to come in half an hour before work and not pay for it, <coughs> stay half an hour after work and not pay, you know, and during a week that adds up to quite a lot. And companies, um, you know, national companies who split a 24 hour week over six days so that they're paying so much in travel, it really becomes very, very difficult for them to earn anything to live on. Um, I just, and also coupled with that, you've got um, less help with anybody being able to take. A company to a tribunal. I, I really have huge concerns about what the young are going through at the moment. And I understand that we're, um, as, as a country, um, lessening unemployment, which is great, but at what cost to our young people? Do, do you think government is aware of what's happening really for, 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 for young ones who are on the receiving end of companies' dubious practices? No, I think it's absolutely awful. And actually, the, the uh, Vince Cable has already said that if re elected, um, he and the Liberal Democrats will make a, a priority out of zero hours. Zero hours didn't really creep in in a huge way until fairly recently, as you'll probably know. But it's now being exploited to hell. And you've got companies which are very rich indeed, bluntly companies that don't pay their taxes, who then impose upon their young employees not only zero hours contract, the harshest kind of zero hour contract. It's slavery. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's semi slavery. We passed a bill called Modern Slavery the other day in the House of Lords. It was a wonderful bill, but it addressed modern slavery in the sense of things like child trafficking and young women trafficking, I mean, disgusting things like that, which is a sort of slavery. But I couldn't help thinking when we were passing it that we needed to extend the concept to modern slavery among our own youngsters. And that's something which I think we should certainly stop. We're also going to take on, if we get re-elected, don't yet know who our partner will be, and I'm not going to say because I don't know. But on top of that, we're also, Nanny Alexander's made it absolutely plain that we are going to take on, and this is going to be a really difficult one, the whole issue <coughs> of the uh, often international companies that exploit our country, exploit other countries, not only in terms of employment, in terms of employment behaviour, but also in terms, of course, of cutting out their taxation, deciding that they're actually based in Ireland, a very popular place to be based, you do no trade, but you pay no tax. And it's that kind of thing we've got to address. I'm not one of those who is starry-eyed about the beauties of the capitalist system. I think it would be very harsh. And you've got to have strong regulation. And I think we're getting that in for the banks at last, but we now have to go and look at these huge, big, major companies which seem to think the world was made for them and not them to serve the world. There's so I agree with you. There's a lot of quite well-thought-of companies as well. I mean, I'm not going to oh, yeah. names, oh, but famous but companies. Famous you know, companies. For yeah. being great companies are also doing oh, you're quite right. they can, you know, Go and have a good look at where your last book came from. Mm. Just for an example. I'd better ask the gentleman about how to like make my last one, I think. From uh, your inside track, here, with your knowledge of uh, government in the past and your knowledge of the personalities now, what lessons do you think our party has learned from the negotiation of an experience of the coalition that will be taken into the inevitable donkey dealing after the 7th of May? Okay, good question again. Um, I'll split it into two bits. One is the lessons we should learn anyway, and the second is the lessons we specifically learned from the coalition negotiations. 
One of the lessons we have to learn anyway, as a people, if you like, as a citizen, is that something should take and do take a long time. If you want to, for example, reform the education system, or the health system, or the transport system, we've got to learn that it doesn't happen tomorrow. If you expect it to happen tomorrow, it will happen badly. It will happen with lots of flaws and mistakes. So that would be one thing I think one can <coughs> learn. That modern democracies are expecting immediate reactions, immediate responses, immediate answers, and that often gets them into very deep trouble. I'll give you one example <coughs> which will surprise you, the war on Iraq. Instead of not taking time, we ran into it. We've paid a terrible price, and the Iraqis have paid a higher price for it. And if we'd taken time to think about it, to work it out, to talk to people, I think we'd never entered into that really quite disastrous episode. On the question specifically from the coalition, what I would say is if you want to keep if you want to keep yourself honest, the crucial thing to do, especially in a democratic party like ours, and those of this room who are members will know just how democratic it is. I mean, we are actually bound by policy decisions from conference. What you need to do is to lay down very early on the principles of your so-called red lines. What are the things you won't possibly compromise on? There are a number of examples, civil liberties in our case, possibly Europe but you can think of your own. Don't ever let those particular principles be compromised, and then you can work on the necessary compromises of coalition, because you do have to compromise quite a lot. But always remember what are the fundamental basic principles, the ones you won't compromise on, and then you will be in a position where you can negotiate and bargain and do so with an honest heart and go into that government with an honest heart. But you must know what the things are you wouldn't dream of. Let me give you one example of the many you might make. I think we could never compromise on torture. We probably did briefly during the Iraqi period. We did send some people off to be tortured in places like Morocco. We didn't, we didn't wash our own hands clean, but we'd make sure that somebody else did the nasty work. But it wasn't much of it. There was just a bit of it at the edges. I think if we'd come back and said we'd agreed to Guantanamo Bay, we should be ashamed of ourselves. So those are the kind of things I think that have red lines that you mustn't cross.